Lack of knowledge. My people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. You know, there is a book in the Minor Prophets, which is like reading tomorrow's newspaper. name of it is Hosea, which comes from the Hebrew word saved or salvation, meaning it's God's way of telling you how to find salvation. And actually, he pulled Hosea off to the side in chapter 1 and said, I want you to go marry a wife of whoredoms. And each child was named like Loami and Ruhamah and so forth. Each of those names translated from the Hebrew means not my people or not loved. But through working out their salvation through Hosea, then they were changed. The names were to Ami, meaning my people, and, uh, and Ruhamah rather than Lo Ruhamah to say, I love her. God loves his children. But from this, in chapter 4, I want you to open the next book right after Daniel, the book of Hosea in the Minor Prophets, chapter 4, and chapter 4 reads, Hear the word of the Lord, you children of Israel. For the Lord hath a controversy with the inhabitants of the land, because there is no truth, nor mercy, nor knowledge of God in the land. And that's real sad. You know, it's real sad that most people don't realize that the house of Judah and the house of Israel are split. That the ten tribes of northern Israel were taken captivity 200 years before Judah was taken captive by Nebuchadnezzar. And the prophecies, if you do not have the knowledge to know the split and what prophecies proclaim to who, then how are you going to know what he wants you to do? And who are you? I mean, is it any accident that America, the superpowers of superpowers, is, is not mentioned in the Word of God, and yet here we are, a superpower of superpowers? Pull out a coin out of your pocket. What does it say? In God we trust. Do you think that's an accident? Verse 2, by swearing and lying and killing and stealing and committing adultery, they break out and blood touches blood. One murder after another. That's what the, that translates. 3, therefore shall the land mourn, and everyone that dwelleth therein shall languish of, with the beasts of the field and with the fowls of heaven. Yea, the fishes of the sea also shall be taken away. Boy, you, you can't eat it in a lot of places. You know why? Mercury, pollution, poison. What are you going to do? You're going to be very careful because we destroy ourselves because of lack of knowledge. Verse 4. Yea, yet let no man strive nor reprove another don't start pointing any fingers. For thy people are as they that strive with the priest. In other words, trying to prove a case, and yet none of them know what they're talking about. Why? They're not familiar with the Word of God. Listen to too many one-verse Reverend Charlies that never quite get around to teaching God's Word chapter by chapter and verse by verse to learn what God saith. And there they float from one paycheck to another rather than having stability in life, uh, as a child of God should. Verse 5, Therefore shalt thou fall in the day, and the prophet also shall fall with thee in the night, and I will destroy thy mother. Of course, that is, Mother Israel is, you would know her. But he does find her again, why? Through the name Hosea, salvation. Uh, you do know who the Savior is, that's Christ, okay? And through him uh, we find. Verse 6, listen carefully. This is why we came here. My people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. Because thou hast rejected knowledge, I will also reject thee. That thou shalt be no priest to me. You're not going to try to preach my word if you're just going to mess around with your own words and traditions. Seeing thou hast forgotten the law of thy God, I will also forget thy children. Well, you don't understand, brother. Christ did away with the law on the cross. That's a lie. He did not. It's not written. 
You're listening to traditions of men lacking knowledge. Christ said in Matthew 5, I don't change the sound of one letter of the law. Many of the rituals, blood rituals, were nailed to the cross with him. His blood was shed for one and all times. But you bet, if, you don't, if you don't have enough knowledge to know the difference between law, statutes, and ordinances, you're in a heap of hurt. Now, people are destroyed because of lack of knowledge. Verse 7, As they were increased, so they sinned against me. Therefore will I change their glory into shame. If they're not careful. Example, ultimately it comes down that we know if you have knowledge about God's word that the sixth trump, the spurious Messiah, appears in Jerusalem claiming to be Jesus. Do you know that? It's written in God's word over and over and over again. Have you read it? And many that do not know will worship him. And that that they thought was their salvation turns out to be their shame because they're in bed with Satan. That's why he told uh, Hosea to go marry a harlot. They don't know who they're messing around with. Puts it very plain where anyone can understand. Now, um, our Father gives us truth. And, he, and, and as I stated, he always puts it in a language. Do you know what he wants from you? A lot of people picture him, or might as well, as the one with horns, the pitchfork, and the red long handle underwear. That he's going around ready to throw people in hell. He doesn't want to zap anybody. He loves you. As it is written in 2 Peter chapter 3, verses 7 and 8, it is God's will that all come to repentance and find salvation. But they won't do it. Why? They're destroyed because of lack of knowledge. They don't know any better, nor does it seem they care. Just let me make it from one day to the next, and let me make it from payday to payday, and I'll be happy. Oh, wouldn't you like to live forever? Wouldn't you like to be in heaven? Wouldn't you like to have the blessings of God even now in the flesh body? Because he said, hey, you turn your back on me, and I'm going to turn on you. Now, you know, it would seem to me that people are pretty, pretty accurate in looking where they can place their money and get get the most interest or borrow money for the least interest, at least some are, you will never find anything that will pay dividends, and I don't particularly care for this analogy, but more than eternal life and God loving you. Why wouldn't you want to please him? It pays greater dividends than anything in the world is to have your life lengthen rather than going into the pit for eternity with your Father who loves you. Ami, my people. That's what he wants, okay? Now, um, what does he want from his children? Go, turn on over while we're here to chapter 6, verse 6. If you ever want to know what God really wants out of you, if you want to know how to please him, don't ever forget this verse. Salvation, which is to say Hosea 6, 6, and it reads... For I desired mercy, that's love, unmerited favor, love, okay? I desired love and not sacrifice. And the knowledge of God, the what? The knowledge of God more than burnt offerings, your old burnt animals. I don't want them. I want your love. And I want you to have knowledge. Now, you know, man can come by knowledge. You can, you can have knowledge to know how to rip your neighbor off in this world, you know, to really get ahead, to kind of trump on people. That's street knowledge of getting along, surviving. That's not God's way, though. If you really want to survive, you've got to do it God's way. So knowledge doesn't come from the world. Satan kind of feeds those evil thoughts and oppression and servitude and anxieties. God offers you peace. Not just peace for today and not just peace for tomorrow, but forever. Forever. So don't ever forget that verse. God wants from you love. He wants you to love Him. 
Do you know that's the one thing, and you've heard me say it many times, he will not force you to do. He won't force anyone to love him. You know why? How would you like to force someone to love you? Wouldn't that be beautiful? That's putrid to force someone to love you. Okay. In other words, it's not real love. Doesn't even understand what love is if you think in those terms. Love must generate within each entity, within each heart, outwards toward God. Otherwise, he won't mess with it. This is why Satan is doomed to hell. He loves himself. And he cares less about God. So, how do we then find knowledge? We don't want knowledge of the street. Turn with me to Proverbs chapter 1, right after the great book of um, Psalms. Proverbs chapter 1. You know who Proverbs was written by? Solomon, David's son, who was wise, wise, wise. So it pays to listen to wisdom from your father's word, not man, not this man or any other man, without checking out what does God think, what does God say, what pleases God, if you want God's blessings in your life. Otherwise, hey, tough trip, friend. Without him, you're, you have a rough road to, to hope, really rough. I, I can't imagine someone just walking up to a brick wall and just beating their head pulpy, you know. But a lot of people choose to do that rather than listen to wisdom. Proverbs uh, chapter 1, verse 1. The Proverbs of Solomon, the son of David, king of Israel. It's supposed to be. Verse 2. To, who, to know wisdom and instruction to perceive the words of understanding. You know what understanding is? Basically common sense. When you understand something, you can see through it and you can handle it. Okay? You can either go through it, over it, around it, under it, but when you understand with utilizing common sense, you're going to make it through. Okay? Mainly because God's going to see to it. Verse 3. To receive the instruction of wisdom, justice, and judgment, and equity. That, that's um, uh, prudence. To do what's right. To know what's right. And, um, you know, there are some people that just can't handle instruction. And it starts when they're a small child. So you want to be careful about that. Normal to a certain degree. But when they refuse instruction... Uh, that, then you want to be real careful. You know, the next thing that sets in when someone refuses, they know everything. And when you get around one of those people that know everything, you can't hardly stand them, all right? especially if you do know everything. <laughs> oh, mercy. But anyway, <laughs> be real careful with your children about receiving instruction. Always... Always talk to a child, explain why they can listen to God's instruction. It pays great dividends. It keeps you from stumping your old toe and getting bloody footed all the time in life. Keeps you out of trouble. Verse 4. To give subtlety or prudence to the simple, to the young man knowledge and discretion. That, that discretion of, of understanding and how to think something through before you just bounce into it, okay? Use discretion. Use it in life, all right? When, when you hear a thing that seems foreign to your ear from what you've ever heard from God's Word, you better say, whoa, haw, mew, okay? Something wrong. This doesn't fit. That's your common sense working for you. That's your understanding working for you, saying, I balk at this. I'm going to have to look into it. And if it is bad, cull it. Throw it out. You don't have time in your life for bad traditions. Okay? Verse 5, A wise man will hear and will increase learning. 
He's going to be successful. Okay. And a man of understanding, that's to say having common sense, shall attain unto wise counsels. He's going to listen to somebody that knows what they're talking about. If, if, you, have to, if you have to build a, well, what, what are we going to build? Let's say an outhouse, okay? Uh, we're way back in the country, okay? Then if you're going to get advice, are, are you going to go to church and ask the preacher? I don't think so. You're going to somebody that has a lot of experience building outhouses. Now that applies to anything in life. You know where most people go? They, I mean, where I can get some free advice. Free advice can cost you more than you. Well, we've got a bunch of men. They're elderly, and they sit down here on the corner spitting and whittling, and just talking. And they got they seem to know everything. And they'll give you advice all you want free. But then ask yourself, what are they doing down on the corner spitting and whittling? Why aren't they accomplishing something? So see, don't don't go to somebody that's a failure or a punk and ask advice. Do you know what you'll get? Punkishness. Worthless advice. Counsel. You go where you know. Well, how do I know? They've proved themselves. They've already done it. Okay? I'm. You know, that... My old granddad told me, you know, and I'm, I, here I'm bringing my person into this, and this is true. He said, son, I don't, he raised me, and he said, I don't care where you go and, and how I've taught you about farming. It's different all over the country. So you pick out the most successful farmer in the area you purchased land and go ask his advice. You understand? I did that here when I first moved here. And I've been successful ever since, okay? truly. It works, in other words, and that's common sense. That's just plain old using your head, all right? Go to somebody that has already proved what works and follow suit as best you can. doesn't hurt to improve it. If you get a good idea, try it. And if you fall on your face, do it a different way. You know, keep, don't be a quitter. Okay, so hunt wise counsel. Verse 6, to understand a proverb, that's something, a deep saying, and the interpretation, the words of the wise and their dark sayings. Verse 7, listen carefully. This is why we came here. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. Now, stop it. What is this word fear in the Hebrew manuscripts? It's yara. Yara. It has two meanings. It means to reverence or to with awesome fear, meaning amazement at how great our Father is, but mostly to reverence, to love Him. So I would prefer to translate this. You've got a strong concordance. Check it out. It will translate reverence. So I'd rather read it there. The reverence of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge, but fools despise wisdom and instruction. They won't listen. You can't tell them anything. They already know it. They're hell-bent for election, all right? knowing not what tomorrow brings. Whereas wisdom and loving your father you still don't know necessarily what tomorrow brings, but do you know something? He does. And when you take his counsel and his advice, he's going to take you under his wing, tucked away there, and he does know what tomorrow brings, and he's going to guide you in such a way that you're going to be in the right place at the right time rather than being off in a bar ditch fixing flats or something in your trip through life. He can take some of those big rocks out of your road when you love him and listen to him. Do you understand that's only natural and he's supernatural? If you're in good standing with him and you let him know that you love him, Father, I love you. I really care that he's going to embrace you and take care of you. It makes a big difference in life. So. It's up to you. You sail your own ship. If you want to go to hell, have a good trip. Okay? 
enjoy life as best you can. But you could live for an eternity being a child of God and having His blessings and enjoying a little bit of heaven right here on earth by being prosperous. But I, I thought Christians are supposed to be poor. Now see, there you go listening to people again. Do you know how that got started, preachers wanting all your money? Okay, saying so you are to be poor, give all your money to me. Okay, do you believe do you, that? What scripture is that? It's not. Okay, it's not. So, be very careful. Your, God promises you blessings and wealth, riches. Okay, but He will only give you what you're able to take care of. Okay, so take inventory. All right. Uh, one more verse. My son, hear the instruction of thy father and forsake not the law of thy mother. That's to say the law of God's word, his knowledge, his understanding. Turn with me to chapter 4 of this Proverbs while we're here. Chapter 4, verse 1. Listen to it carefully. Hear ye children the instructions of a father. This is our heavenly father. And attend to no understanding. That's discernment, common sense. Think it through. For I give you good doctrine. I give you the truth. Forsake ye not my law. God gave you these instructions for a purpose, so that you could would be pleasing to Him, and you would be successful. For I was my father's son, tender and only beloved in the sight of my mother. I was a young child once, Solomon says. He taught me also and said unto me, Let thine heart retain my words. That your mind. Keep them in your mind. Keep my commandments and live. Do you want to add a word to that? Live again. Okay. Or live eternally, if you prefer. Do you, again, what, what brings that to pass? God's word. God's knowledge. His truth guiding you. Get wisdom, verse 3, get wisdom, get understanding, forget it not, don't you lay it down, neither decline from the words of my mouth, you listen to the words of God. Who was the living word? Christ was. And what was Christ's tongue? Revelation chapter 1, verse 15, a two-edged sword, it cuts both ways, it's truth. Verse six: Forsake her not. You cling to, you you cling to that understanding and wisdom, and she shall preserve thee. She's going to take care of you. Love her, and she shall keep thee. She'll reach out and embrace you. Wisdom is a beautiful thing. It's a very wonderful thing to have. It belongs to God. All wisdom and knowledge comes from God. Not street smart. But that that's eternal. Wisdom is the principal thing, therefore get wisdom. And with all thy getting, get understanding. Use a little common sense and good judgment to go along with it. Think things through. Think for yourself. Exalt her, and she shall promote thee. She shall bring thee to honor when thou dost embrace her. So you embrace wisdom. Yearn for it. Search for it but know where to look for it. You find it in God's Word. Our Father sent you a letter, and He expects you to listen. And a lot of people say, well, I claim the promises of God and He never fulfills. Well, you know, every promise that God makes, there's, there's a big old word parked right there usually in one form or the other, and it's I-F, if. I will bless you if you love me. They just say, I'm claiming it, and they forget about God and loving Him. Or He says, I will bless you when you hear my commandments, and there's that big old word again, a condition. God's promises are conditional. Okay. If you hear my commandments and do them, you got to be a doer, can-do type person. Well, I'd rather be a poor to me little old baby. You know, I got something. I want something to whimper about. It just makes me feel good to get up in the morning and cry and whimper and moan and groan. Well, you better enjoy it because it's a slick way to hell. Okay, it'll get you there quicker than anything. Rather than waking up 
and getting into God's Word, listening to God, your Father, that has provided you a way to overcome Satan's weaknesses. Because all pity parties are is Satan picking at you. You poor little thing. Ain't you? you know, yeah, the whole world picks on you, don't they? Ah uh ha! -huh. Yeah, ah uh ha! -huh. That's it's a, it's amazing and how quick he can suck some people in, rather than being strong. Can do. That's the kind of people God likes. Hey, he can use you if he can count on you. You know why? There's a battle coming up, a controversy. And it's between God and Satan. And God intends to stay on the throne with Christ right beside him until his enemies are made his footstool. Who do you think is going to put him there? Okay. Now, worry takes in a lot of people. Worry is a waste of time. Worry warts, I don't know, I guess it's kind of natural with some people, but you ought to quit it. Because to worry is to doubt every promise of God. Okay. I want you to turn with me to Luke 12. Let's put some of this knowledge and wisdom, let's touch Christ's teachings with it and see what knowledge or lack of knowledge can do to us while we're in this uh, vein of thought and study. Luke chapter 12. I'm gonna, what, what we're doing here is uh, Christ is teaching and he says, hey, you shouldn't worry about people that can just kill the flesh body. You ought to worry about Almighty God that can cause your soul to perish. Okay, That means going into the lake of fire or letting you live eternally and happily. Okay, So knowledge kind of counts. And why would somebody be a worry ward? Well, listen, verse 6 of chapter 12 the great book of Luke. Luke was a medical doctor, all right? He uses medical terminology at cases, which ensures he is the author, but God is the spokesman and the writer thereof. Verse 6 reads, Are not five sparrows sold for two fulfins, and not one of them is forgotten before God? I mean, they're worth almost nothing. And yet God has room for all of them. And who are you? Who are, do you think you're less than uh, a, a little sparrow? Verse 7. But even the very hairs of your head are all numbered. Fear not, therefore, ye are of more value than many sparrows. Don't worry. The main thing that knowledge should do to you is give you courage, give you understanding. If you're a real believer, or maybe you just like to play belief, Okay. If you're a real believer, when he said, I will not leave you, nor will I forsake you, he meant it. Do you receive it? You better, because he will not. He is always with you. And do you know what he says furthermore in chapter 9 of the great book of Revelations, verse 4, what he tells Satan when Satan gets ready to tromp? He said, don't you dare touch those that have the seal of God in their forehead. Do you know what having the seal of God in your forehead is? It's knowledge. It's God's knowledge in your forehead, meaning you can't be deceived. Why? Satan can't fool you. You know him. You know his method of operation, his M.O., because you've read God's letter to you telling you what Satan intends to do at the la at the, in the final generation. Okay, so... Um, Verse 8, say, Also I say unto you, Whosoever shall confess me before men, him shall the Son of Man also confess before the angels of God. I'm going to claim them. They're mine. I love them. They're my brethren. Verse 9, But he that denieth me before men shall be denied before the angels of God. You deny me, you just go on about your business. I don't know you, and I don't want to know you. That's what your attitude is what God is saying. And whosoever shall speak a word against the Son of Man, it shall be forgiven him. The Son of Man is the name of Jesus when he walked the earth as a man. If you say something against him, 
then it can be forgiven. Okay? But unto him that blasphemeth against the Holy Spirit, it shall not be forgiven. Well, what did he mean by that? Well, read on. Read on for clarity. And when they bring you unto the synagogues and unto magistrates and powers, this means from on high, satanic in other words, take ye no thought how or what thing you shall answer or what you shall say. Twelve, for the Holy Spirit shall teach you in the same hour, that's important if you have knowledge, in the same hour what you ought to say. What's he talking about? He's talking about God's election that are taught over and over. God wants to speak through you when you're delivered up before the synagogue of Satan as it is written at the sixth trump. I don't know. Have you ever read it? It's not what commonly men think, but it's what God says. Now, who do you listen to? God or man, man's traditions that make void the word of God sometimes if you're not real careful. Do you know what hour he's talking about? He's talking about Christ's sermon in uh, Mark chapter 13. Let's just go there because this is what is called the unpardonable sin. You commit this baby and you won't be forgiven in this world or in the one to come. Right? You don't want that to happen to you. Well, how do I prevent it? Knowledge. Knowledge, the Word of God. You'll learn that knowledge in Mark chapter 13. You could learn the same thing in Matthew 24. You could learn the same thing in Luke 21 because it's written over and over and over. Jesus was asked one time, what's it going to be like at the end in the events that consummate the end of this age? Tell us, what will be the signs then? And he gives you all seven of the trumps here in this 13th chapter, letting you know exactly how it's going down. Have you read it? Let's cover some of it. Verse 5 of uh, Mark 13. And Jesus answering them began to say, Take heed lest any man deceive you. What's the first warning? Don't let man deceive you. If, if you have a great lack of knowledge, that could happen pretty easy. But if you have God's knowledge, it's not going to happen. What is his warning? Verse 6. For many, not a few, many shall come in my name, saying, I am Christ, and shall deceive many. There's a lot of people going to come to you and say, I, using his name, Christ man. I'd be a Christian. I, I'd be a Christian. You can trust me. I'll buy something from you. Or some businessman advertised Christian business. Boy, will you get the business in some of them, okay? Yeah. And, and if you let man deceive you, whose fault is it? Christ warned you. But unfortunately, many of them come with turned around claws on their collar, claiming to be Christian preachers. But they never quite seem to get around to teaching God's Word. They've got one verse to make it look holy. And then it gets full of holes for a scholar, right? Real quick, like. Okay. God gave you a plan of the day. He gave you a plan of exactly how things are going down. Have you read it? Okay. Don't let man deceive you just because they claim to be in Christ's name. Okay. Um, verse um, seven. And when you shall hear of wars and rumors of wars, be ye not troubled. Don't worry about it. For such things must needs be, but the end shall not be yet. Now, what is the opposite of wars and rumors of wars? Peace. Have you ever heard of the road map to peace? Kind of, you know, if you haven't, you don't listen to the news much, do you? All right? That's the plan that's going taking place right today in Israel, in, in Palestine, and in Gaza and in many other places. The road map to peace. Now, if we're talking more, that's one thing. That's, but he said, as long as you hear that, don't worry a whole lot. But when you hear peace, you better cinch up your belt. Okay? For nation shall rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom, and there shall be earthquakes in diverse places, and there shall be famines of, and troubles. These are the beginning of the sorrows. 
Do you know what this word sorrows is in the Greek? It's labor pains. The birth of a new age coming in. That's, that's what you're, you're, lets you know it's on us. It's about to happen. Verse 9, But take heed to yourselves, for they shall deliver you up to councils, and in the synagogues, this is not a synagogue, a regular church. This is the synagogue of Satan, okay, when he appears as the spurious Messiah. And in the synagogues you shall be beaten, and you shall be brought before rulers and kings for my sake. Well, who's that? For Christ's sake. To teach. It's special. But I just wish I had a part. Well, listen, you do. For my sake for a testimony against them. And what, what, what hour are we talking about? The one we just read of, that you shouldn't be deceived. Don't have, let the lack of knowledge cause you to prevent or to commit the unpardonable sin. 10. And the gospel must first be published among all nations. Why? Through you. Through some that are delivered up. I don't know. Do you know when to stand? Uh, are you going to, or do you have a butterfly suit to fly away? It's not biblical. The gospel armor is to place on, to stand against the fiery darts of Satan. Okay? To just get it real clear. Ephesians chapter 6. Do you believe God or do you believe man? Verse 11. But when they shall lead you and deliver you up, take no thought beforehand what you shall speak, neither do you premeditate, but whatsoever shall be given you in that hour. That's the hour. That's the hour he's talking about. That speak ye, for it is not ye that speak, but the Holy Spirit. And so it is. Do you know that even in the great book of Revelation, in closing, in chapter 2, uh, I mean, you know, some people will tell you, you, friend, listen to me. They'll come in Christ's name saying, you don't have to understand the book of Revelation because, presto, you're going to be gone. Well, it's not biblical. The very word revelation means to unveil or to make known, meaning God's telling you, you better know, okay, or you're suffering from lack of knowledge. Uh, chapter, there's only, there, we're talking here about seven churches, and there's only two that Jesus approved of, and some of them said, the rest of you may go to hell. So you better sharpen up. Well, is it the name of the two churches? No, it's what they were teaching. Smyrna and Philadelphia. Smyrna, chapter 2, verse 8. And in the angel of the church of Smyrna write, These things saith the first and the last which was dead and is alive. Christ resurrected evermore. I know thy works, tribulation and poverty, but thou art rich. Why? In God's eyes. And I know the blasphemy of them which say they are Jews, say our brother Judah, but they're Kenites, okay? And you know it. And are not but are of the synagogue of Satan. That's the one you're delivered up before. Fear none of these things. Skip on, if you would, to the seventh verse of chapter 3, in closing again, I say, And to the angel of the church of Philadelphia write these things, He that is true, he that hath the key to David, and he that openeth, and no man shutteth, and shutteth, and no man openeth. Knowledge lets you open Scripture <clears throat> that a lot of people can't understand. Why? Lack of knowledge. I know thy works. Behold, I have set before thee an open door. You can understand. You have common sense. And no man can shut it, for thou hast a little strength, and hast kept my word, and hast not denied my name. Behold, I will make them of the synagogue of Satan, which say they are of our brother Judah, and are not, but do lie. Behold, I will make them to come and worship at thy feet. Why? Because you're at the feet of Christ, of course. And, of course, the very next verse says... I will allow you to escape the hour of temptation. Do you know you have people that are so have such little knowledge that they think to escape the hour of temptation, they have to write a bunch of stuff in. You're going to fly. When even though it states from God's mouth in Ezekiel chapter 13, verse 20, I'm against those that teach my children to fly to save their souls. You escape the hour of temptation because you know better. You don't find Satan tempting. You find him to be an abomination and you make that stand and you allow the Holy Spirit to speak. Bad time right now to have lack of knowledge, my friends. 
You need to know what goes down in the end times. We're there. We're coming right up to the door. Uh, when will it happen? Who knows for sure. Just be ready. You're a watchman. Heavenly Father, thank you, Father, for the word. Thank you, Father, for your knowledge. Thank you for your understanding. Touch with that knowledge. We ask it in Yeshua's precious name. Amen. The Mark of the Beast on CD is our free introductory offer to you. What is the Mark of the Beast? Many false teachers would have you believe it will be a tattoo on your forehead or a computer chip implanted under your skin. It is getting late in the game. You need to know what the mark of the beast is. As it's written in Revelation chapter 13, verse 8, many will be deceived. There is no need for you to be deceived. Christ said in Mark 13, 23, Behold, I have foretold you all things. Jesus indeed told us how not to be deceived, and Pastor Arnold Murray takes you on a step-by-step -step study of God's Word concerning this critical subject, the mark of the beast. The telephone call is free. The CD is free. We don't even ask for the shipping and handling. It is free as well. All you need to do is call 800-643-4645 to request your one-time, one-per-household copy of the mark of the beast. You may also request your free CD by mailing your request to Shepherd's Chapel, Post Office Box 416, Gravit, Arkansas, 72736. Don't be deceived by Satan. Highs, and of course in the edges of this comes the jet stream, that, and that usually is the cause of a tornado, uh, ult uh, basically. Uh, so, but God can maneuver however he wishes. You're going to find out that he will use nature to destroy this army that covered the sky. I mean, <clears throat> how many tanks or even an airplane do you know that can fly when 180-pound hailstones are dropping down? You know, they don't get very far, okay? David from Pennsylvania, I do not understand the gift of tongues and how it is not received. Well, um, the gift of tongues, um, in the first place, <clears throat> the gift of the Pentecost tongue, is why it is called in the Greek the cloven tongue. It comes out in every language of the world. Not unknown. Pentecost tongue is not an unknown tongue. It's known by everybody that hears it. Whatever language they speak. Uh, Acts, do you believe God's word? Acts chapter 2 verses 6 and 7 declares it. And it is not man that speaks the, un the Pentecost tongue. It's the Holy Spirit. And when it comes out in every language, that's the documentation. That is the same Holy Spirit in preparation of speaking through God's children in, in Mark chapter 13 when they're delivered up before the spurious Messiah. <clears throat> the other gift of tongues, the word in the Greek means a language you were not born with. You had to acquire it by studying. So you don't receive it because you don't study. In other words, if you wanted to go to Sidadi Mihago uh, to teach, you would have to study Spanish and absorb it. Or they wouldn't even know when to say amen when you went down, when you're preaching the gospel. Or you could take an interpreter. Then they wouldn't know when to say amen. But interpreters are a little boring. And God even says in 1 Corinthians 14, don't, don't, don't let two people speak uh, more than two that have to have an interpreter to deliver a message. It's boring. Okay, it doesn't say it's boring. That's just the reason. Okay. <clears throat> so the gift of tongues is the gift of taking God's word across the world by learning languages and being able to deliver it. Ruth from Georgia, does it tell in the Bible how old we will be when we go to heaven? Will we be thirty or around? Uh, there because Jesus was around that age. Well, you'll appear that way. But you'll be thousands of years old. Thousands of years old. Age doesn't mean anything in the eternity. As I was stating, olam in the Hebrew tongue, it means from the beginning, world without end. And uh, that's how old you are. Now, uh, you have to realize in the spiritual body, you don't age, you don't get sick, you don't get old. It's always the same. Okay, And it is true that you can say adult because it will say uh, we will appear as he did. Okay, Crow from WS, I'm going to assume this is uh, 
is why is um, it would have to be Wyoming, Wisconsin, or West Virginia. Uh, so Crow, you have to know where you're at. Okay, uh, I'm going to say probably it's Wisconsin. Um, I have heard from many churches that if you are not physically circumcised, that I cannot enter the kingdom of heaven. Is this true? Absolutely not. I want you to make a note of Colossians chapter 2, verse 11. The circumcision today is for both men and women, and it is of the heart or the mind. Okay. It's, there's no more bloodletting to bring purification. Christ shed all the blood that's ever necessary. So circumcision that cleans is the mind and it's uh, our heart and um, Colossians 2.11 you'll read it uh, see, uh, Gail from California Pastor Murray is it wrong to loan money for a profit I heard that you would lose your blessings uh, it's not so there's nothing wrong with loaning money for a profit to the public but you are not to loan money to your brother and charge usury. Okay. Not to, I'll say it again. There's nothing wrong with investing for profit or entering into usury unless it's family. In family, you don't, you don't charge a family interest. Okay. That's against God's law. Um, there are extenuating circumstances to all things, okay? And um, it is, we're, you're getting here into a situation that can be very touchy. And quite frankly, um, it's, um, we had uh, uh, two people that lived in this town, one was a banker and one plowed gardens for a living. Okay, and I'm not going to mention any names because one of them is still alive and with us, all right, uh, though he's retired from banking. And somebody asked the guy that plowed gardens if he would loan him 50 bucks or something to that. Account. And he said, I'll tell you what, the banker down here and I have an agreement that he don't plow no gardens and I don't loan no money. So it, it's kind of, that's something kind of nice to know. That actually happened right here in Gravit, Arkansas, many, many years ago. Okay, I, I happen to know both men. And uh, uh, the man that made the statement had a very sharp, sharp mind. Uh, just because he plowed gardens didn't uh, indicate the amount of wisdom he possessed. But what my point, be careful, okay, be very careful. It is not necessary, uh, by this, by being careful, don't become used because you're not charging usury. By that I mean don't loan somebody money to buy drugs, or if they have a drug habit, don't loan them money when you know what they're going to do with it. They might even take your money and buy groceries and then take their money and buy drugs you're still enabling them. So be careful. Claudia from Arizona. Claudia from Arizona. What are the symptoms, I'm sorry, what are the scriptures for the key of David? Well, you will find basically the prime root of it is you'll read in Revelation chapter 3 verses 9 and 10. To have the key to David that unlocks scripture for you is to know who the true Christ is and to know who the false Christ is. That's the key. Do you remember in today's lecture it said, my servant David? Because through David would come Messiah, okay, through Mary, all right? And um, that's why God always kept that seed line pure right up to that time of that birth. And, uh, and so it is. But that's where you start. I have a work titled The Key of David, I'm sure. Okay, you'll see it in the tape list. Ryan from Florida. Please explain Hebrews chapter 10, verse 26. I'm confused because I thought once saved, always saved. Well, let me ask you a question. What if you committed the unpardonable sin? 
Are you still saved? The answer is no. The misnomer once saved, always saved is accurate. But that means Christ's work is accurate. You can, you can um, uh, descend after you've been saved with sin, sin, sin until it builds up to the point you're going to hell. But that, didn't, that did not interfere with Christ having saved you at one time. But what is Christ's advice? Repent. Get your act together. Um, or, or it could be as it is written in Hebrews chapter 5, you're like trying to re-crucify Christ all over again when you try to get saved again. All it takes is one time. And then after that, it's up to you to keep your record clean, and you do that by repentance, okay? The unpardonable sin, there's no, there's no forgiveness for it. And that's what was being discussed in that 26th verse of the chapter 10 of the great book of Hebrews. Those that know better, those that know who the Antichrist is and know the Holy Spirit wants to speak through them and disallows it, they commit that sin that is listed in Luke chapter 12, verse 10. Nan Nanny from, or Nancy, or Nanny, or something like that from Ohio. I was baptized when I was 10. I feel like I know a lot more now. And I asked my preacher if I could be rebaptized, and he said, This is not necessary. Please explain why. Well, you should ask him why, okay? But the reason being, if, if you were at the age of accountability and you knew the baptism was between you and Christ, it doesn't, I would hope you know more now than you did then. I hope that every Christian, regardless of their age, as time goes on, becomes wiser and knows more. If that were your rule or reason for being rebaptized, people would have to be rebaptized over and over and over. And that would, that would not be the reason bapti baptism is given in the first place, okay? So uh, your pastor is correct, as long as you knew what you were doing then. Mitchell, Michelle from Oklahoma. Are some sins worse than others, or are they all considered the same? Some sins are worse than others. It's, it's um, um, and uh, I, I mean, I answered this a couple, three weeks ago. I said, well, which is the greater sin, is stealing a piece of bubble gum or shooting somebody? Okay, I, I think that would answer your question. Amy from Pennsylvania. When we get to heaven, if a family member goes to hell, will we remember them? Those that go into the lake of fire are blotted out. If I draw a line on a piece of paper and then blot it out, where is it? It's gone. It doesn't exist. That's what the term blotted out means, and that's what God does. Otherwise, there would be much sorrow in heaven because there would be a lot of people not make it, that people you think quite a bit of. They're just not going to make it. They're not going to be there. But you won't weep for them because you won't remember them. It's as though they never existed. All right? There will be no tears shed in heaven. And, and is that good? Yes, it is. Otherwise, you would have the heaven that some churches uh, draw, where here's the throne of God, and we're all celebrating and rejoicing for being in heaven. And right out here in the middle is this great lake of fire, and there's old Uncle Willie out there screaming his head off, frying like a piece of bacon. And we're, you know, I mean, does that make sense? Of course not. That's ludicrous. Um, that, that really wouldn't be heaven in my books, okay? So don't let somebody paint that picture for you. Mary from Kentucky. My sister and I have had some problems. We are no longer speaking. Is this a sin, and will God forgive me? Well, um, kind of in a way, but it's more of a shame than it is a sin. It's a shame that two siblings can't find it in their hearts. If whatever it is you disagree over, don't talk about it. If it's, if it's Let's say if it's religion. Don't discuss it, but it's your sister. Your, your blood relative. And, and uh, blood is so much thicker than water. Okay. By that I mean 
family will stick with you uh, usually if you're on good terms and it should it should be welded like family and you miss a lot so uh, pride is a terrible thing and usually when two sisters or two brothers won't speak it's because of pride well I'll show him oh well will you you know show him what how stupid you are now I'm not calling you stupid I'm saying sometimes sometimes people can have a lifetime of problems over some silly stupid stuff so I say grow up find a way and sometimes swallow pride maybe hey you know who's the bigger man he that can say but by the grace of God there go I I'm gonna give a little here you know if, if it means that much for this person to be right so to speak or go around it some way there's always a way and I'm not saying to let somebody run over you but I'm saying kinfolk are precious you know and they're certainly worth salvaging unless there is a medical problem where there is no reasoning that can happen also okay hypertension can cause people to think things that aren't true and there's no way you could reason with them in the first place in certain cases and that's that's an illness it's, it's not that person that does it get over it get with it okay hey, I'm out of time I love you all because you enjoy studying our father's word chapter by chapter and verse by verse most of all God loves you for doing it okay let him know that you do love him it makes his day we are brought to you by your tithes and offerings if we've helped you you help us keep coming to you once you do that bless God he will always bless you he is so very important and when we say Ezekiel God strengthens that's exactly what he does he strengthens your life when you make his day now most important what I want you to do is stay in his word set aside just a little bit of time every day in his word even with troubles a good day you know why because Jesus Yeshua is the living word